So one by one, the gunboats get dinged up. Two of them will get jammed together and get interlocked. The rudder system of one, which is a chain system that comes out of the back of the casemate, gets severed, so he no longer has steerage. And you don't turn them around, because A, you can't, there's no room, and B, you don't want to show your unarmored stern to guys that are already punching holes in your armor. So you cut your power and you let the current take you back, Smart. firing your bow guns as long as you can. Finally, the last gunboat here will be the Carondelet. It'll be against the, about where that telephone pole is, against that bank, and these guns will literally pivot and just start shooting the, the tar out of the thing. Your lifeboat davits shot clean, the chimneys puncture with smoke, I mean, with holes and smoke pouring out all over the place. And finally, the, the Carondelet can't take the punishment, it cuts power, and it will slowly drift back downstream. Off here somewhere, and I keep telling the National Park Service we need to do an archaeological sweep and find out exactly where that was. Lieutenant Colonel Nathan Bedford Forrest with one of his uh, company commanders, David C. Kelly, are standing there watching this happen. And Forrest says, for God's sake, Parson, pray, for only God Almighty is going to save this fort. Because what has come over from Fort Henry? The gunboats are invulnerable. They don't expect to hold them. Pillow, when they engage, says, uh, we're engaging the gunboat, sends an email to Johnson and Bowling Green. We don't think we can hold. 30 minutes later, here comes a message. We're kicking the tar out of these guys. And Johnson's like, who's in charge over there? We get this message from the guy. Three minutes later, here comes another message. Uh, what's Pillow drinking? Uh, whatever. So he's he's very confused over there in terms of the real situation. And then comes the, the final email that says, we've defeated the gunboats and they have fallen back. Now, what Grant's expecting is as the gunboats steam by this place because he's disabled the batteries, you hear the steam whistles announcing that we've passed the battery and we've gone on to the Dover Hotel and captured the Confederate supply head. Instead, what he hears, once the word gets out of here, echoing the hills and dales of Dover, Tennessee, is the rebel yell. Oops, Houston, we've got a problem. His gunboats have been defeated. Now, what he is going to do is beg foot to keep one gunboat on the river. I need one to constitute a river threat. If they all go back to Paducah and Cairo and Mound City for repairs, I have no more threat on the river. The Confederates have a secure supply line. They have five steamboats a day coming between Nashville, Clarksville, and here, and back and forth. Running troops, more troops, more supplies, everything else that they need. He'll have to lay siege. And, he, and when you lay siege to have it truly successful, if you can't interdict the enemy supply line, they can evacuate the garrison anytime they want to on those very same steamboats. That's not what Grant wants to hear. He wants the garrison captured intact. You will have a Medal of Honor, one here by uh, Gunner, uh, Bow Gunner Matthew Arthur will win the Medal of Honor for serving his piece as the Quran to let drift downstream, and he keeps up his rate of fire just to in, in an act of defiance. So the gunboats have all been defeated, but he's not, he hasn't given up himself. So that gun will keep throwing balls this way. And believe me, you can see the balls coming. When you have an eight inch ball, as it gets closer, you can see it coming. A 32 pound ball, you can see it coming. A field piece of shell you ball, you can see it coming. That has to be scary. I guess the thing about, about a bullet is you can't see it coming until it hits you, then you know it's there. But it's a whole different thing. We're on top of the powder magazine, it's right below us. There's the door that goes into it. Uh, the powder magazine for the upper battery is, is uh, kind of worn down, so it, it's not there anymore. Somebody was uh, saying last time they hear the gun troops were on the ground, and said they built uh, period, uh, period, they built, well, period design uh, carriages. They're made of concrete, but they are absolutely identical to the carriages made of wood that they would have had. So these guns will be up and mounted uh, for quite some time. Now the story goes that that gun, that 10-inch Columbiad is an actual one, the six and a half inch rifle is a fiberglass tube, but that one's real, and it was supposedly at the 1st Tennessee Heavy Artillery's battery at Vicksburg. If you've been to Vicksburg, it's the last Confederate battery on the north side, right above the Mississippi River on the hill. If that's the case, that's the gun that sank the USS Cincinnati. Put a round through the top of its roof, out through the gun deck, through the hull, went down and was not raised until after Vicksburg had spread. And supposedly Vicksburg wants the gun back and the parker says go pound sand or give us another gun. <laughs> but that's the gun that supposedly did it, manned by those intrepid Tennesseans, the first Tennessee heavy artillery. These gunboats again were not in Bulwer. Several of them were sunk and raised later on. And the only one that still survives today is the Cairo. How many of you have seen the Cairo? It's pretty amazing. It's, it's a pretty amazing weapon system. The guy who, who built them was James Eads. If you've been to St. Louis, the, the Iron Bridge, first Iron Bridge across the Mississippi, and still there is the Eads Bridge. He's quite a guy. Do you have a question? Yeah. You're wrong. Next. <laughs> <laughs> I love All right. Now, now, given everything 
<laughs> we've talked about, you know, the advantage of them being high versus low. Mm -hmm. Was there any thought given to find in any place, even if standing rock wasn't going to work, that had a high bluff like this place did, where they would have the advantage to defend on the Tennessee? Uh, other than standing rock, no. Other than standing rock, no. Clarksville, our Fort Defiance there is actually too high. Yeah. I took Glenn Robertson there, and he says this fort's way too high. So yeah, I know about at least fifty feet because well, you have to approach the barrel. Like, no, you 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 play the hand that you're dealt, and they're playing the hand. Now this is a great great area. You got great plunging fire. Yeah. They're, they have to overcompensate and tend to overshoot. Yeah, I mean, you can see the obvious advantage. Yeah. If you think knowing that, they sure try like hell to try to find. The well, the place to the place to have done it would have been where Fort Hyman is, but by, by the time they're building these forts, Kentucky's still a neutral state. So you can't do it. And by every, by the time the neutrality issues moved, the first part of September, they've gotten so far along on these forts, like, look, we got a manpower problem as it is getting them done. We're not gonna start again. The best thing to do would have been move about six miles downstream to the line port, and just over the line, and the isthmus is only four miles apart, and it's high ground on both sides. And that was proposed. Let's go to the line port. Are you kidding me? We can barely get these two things done. Are we talking about stopping and moving everything down there? Wasn't gonna happen. These guys, were the guns Oh, okay. So let me get an answer to that. Here, here, I'm glad you brought that up. Where do these Confederate guns come from? Well, your, your 10 inches and your 6 and a half inches were cast at the front of the Ironworks in Richmond, Virginia. The 32s and 42s were captured at the Gosport Navy Yard in Norfolk. When the Virginia State Troops captured the Gosport Navy Yard, they, they captured the, C, the USS Merrimack, which they turned into CSS Virginia. Uh, some other ships were burned, but they captured hundreds of artillery troops. There is a document that you can get at the Library of Virginia that is a report to the Virginia legislature of all the items that were captured at the Gosport Navy Yard. And it was hundreds of pieces of artillery. Now, how can you tell on these 32 pounders which one are naval guns and which ones were designed for land for? It's really easy to get to know. Is that one a naval gun or a land gun? Or is the ones with the that one or that one a naval gun or a land gun? gun because of that ring. These are naval guns. Because of the ring, you put your big rope through there, that's part of your recoil system. Tied to two pulleys on the side of the hull. So the gun would kick back, the rope would pull it to a stop, you would reload your gun, roll it forward using the exact same rope, fire, repeat. These are land-based guns. But these tubes largely will come from the captured stocks at Gosport Navy Yard. It's hundreds of tubes. I've since found some railroad invoices of them shipping guns on the East Tennessee and Virginia Railroad from here to Columbus, to Nashville, to Clarksville. Just, but the problem was you have 11 guns here, 17 guns of Fort Henry, and Columbus, Kentucky will have 142. Oops, mm. a little too much that way. Now they'll get most of them out by, by the time Columbus falls. They'll ship them down to island number 10 in New Madrid. But, um, but there weren't a lot of them. Uh, they were smooth bore and they rifled them. Not many. You would have to you'd have to have the rifling equipment to do it. I thought they sent them down to New Orleans or someplace. Now there were there were some guns that were, that were cast down there. Yeah, you're right. There were a few small ones. That, the vast majority vast majority are, are smoothbore though. And they actually blew up. One of them blew up. That's the, that's the Lady Polk, which is supposed to be, depending on which report you read, a six and a half inch rifled Columbiad. Mm -hmm. Because this is the only one that we know of that was used in action that didn't explode. The Lady Polk did. A couple other ones did, and it's because the rifling process weakened the metal. So basically, Trudiger quit casting them and stayed with a 10 inch uh, smoothbore, which never blew up. So when Selma Naval Works comes online in 63, casting Brooks and Armstrongs, uh, their advertising slogan was Selma guns never burst. <laughs> Take that, Trudiger. And actually, they will cast more heavy guns than Trudiger does. Better, better modern technology to make these cannons, the ones that were in storage were on the fence you know, becoming obsolete until they became rifles or not. Well, I mean, you can still, yeah, you can still, you know, hold a fort against a, uh, a wooden fleet at 800 yards oh, with sure. a smooth Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, look what they did here in the iron plants. They kicked them up. They, they, they kicked them in the team. So that's, they used what they had, and they, I mean, they would augment as much with rifle artillery as they could, but the vast majority of the guns at all these fortifications all along the Atlantic coast and everything else, 32 and 42 pounds of board. Where's the one that you blew up? What's that? One of these? The one in the upper battery down there. Uh, was it all solid shot? Yep. Fire yeah, you're not going to fire an explosive shell when you're trying to penetrate something. And they're not firing an explosive shell back. They want to knock the earth down. But if you go to the Ogeechee River in Fort McAllister, which was a sand fort, virtually involved.
vulnerable to the Yankee Ironclads. They're throwing 11 inch balls at that thing. The Confederates and I just shovel it in, shovel more. They never could reduce it. They finally gave up. They were bringing monitors up there, 11 inch balls. They throw up a big pile of sand. The sand is more dense than dirt. Is. So the Confederates would go out and shovel more sand. In. They never could take more than cows. Until Hazen showed up and took it by land assault. Did they have the same huge problems that the they did with you the don't have to use those all the time. Yes, Confederate fuses always have that. All right, back in the bus.